All right, Meta Church, how you guys doing? Yeah. Man, uh, right now, our Helotus location is having their second service in our grand opening. Y'all make some noise for what God is doing here. So incredible. The, and the first service, they had a, a packed house. It was very exciting. And uh, man, we're just, we're overwhelmed by what God is doing as we have still one vision, but we now have two venues, more opportunity for people to meet together and to move together to see the purpose that God has put in their lives. Uh, my message for us today is called A New Chapter, A New Chapter. You guys know I, I love to read. This was not always true. In fact, I, I hated to read for a long time. Uh, I saw it as punishment when I was in school. Uh, I would get the, uh, the, the cliff notes, you know, so I could just read it in a hurry and pass the test that I needed to pass. But somewhere in the last five years, I, I really fell in love with it. And, uh, you know, there's a, a common saying, you guys know this, you can't judge a book by its by its cover, and, and that's true. There are some really great books that have really horrible uh, art and fonts on the front of them. Uh, but I also believe, and have come to believe, you actually can't judge a book by its first two chapters. I, I had this weird thing, a little bit of a perfectionist in some areas, and when I first started really reading, I, I couldn't not finish a book. I had to finish it. If I didn't finish it, it, it would feel like a failure. And so I would read an 800-page biography that was horribly written, had nothing that I could apply to my life, but I couldn't put it down because then I would be a failure. I got to read it all the way to the end. I got to read the acknowledgments. I got to read the appendix and then I can be done. And somewhere along the way, God finally released me from my own craziness. And now I can look at a book and say, book, you don't have power over me. I will put you away if I want to. And I don't waste a whole lot of time. Um, but I have a rule that I'll always read three chapters. And here's why. Um, stories can be diagrammed. There's like seven main parts of most stories. But, but the three most important is there's always what, what I'm going to call a setup. And then there's always tension. And then there's always a resolve. And the setup is important, but it's a little bit boring. It's just kind of setting the scene. It's laying the foundation. And normally in the first couple of chapters, you haven't gotten to the action because the action takes place in the tension. And so I always read through three chapters. If you can't draw my attention after three chapters, we're going down to half price books. I'm, I'm offloading you getting something else. But, but I get through the first two because that's just the setup, and it's the tension that draws you in, that makes you keep turning the page, that makes you want to move into the next chapter and see what's going to happen. It's, it's the, the action, the tension, the, the pressure, the, the suffering that the character goes through. All of this builds into a great story, and of course, you don't want to stay in the tension forever. At some point, you want to see the resolve. You want to come to some kind of a conclusion. Similarly, I think that we all go through such significant seasons of our life and we're changing and we're growing and we have seasons where we're rejoicing and we have seasons when we're really suffering. And if we look back, we can probably see different chapters throughout our life as well. And, and there's uh, many people listening to this message across our now six services that we have at MetaChurch. And each person is in their own unique chapter of their life. Some of you are still in the setup and life is a little bit easy. You're not yet dealing with the tension that often comes inside of a marriage. You're just in the setup. You're dating, you're figuring it out. You're seeing what you like in somebody, what you value, what you get along with, what kind of personality that you would wanna spend the rest of your life with. You're still in the setup. You haven't quite made it to the tension. Some of you are in the setup. You're not in a career path. You're not fighting for promotions. You're not stacking back for retirement. You're just working jobs. You know, you're applying, you're on, you're on a, a monster.com. You're just kind of trying to see where you fit and where your passion is at. And uh, many of you are in the tension. You're, you're in the mess. You're in the conflict. And when we're watching a movie or we're reading a story or we're listening to something, we love the tension. This is what draws us in and, and keeps us going back, keeps us clicking. Next episode, next episode. Netflix, are you still alive? Yes, next episode. It just keeps dragging us along. It's the tension, the inherent tension. And it's great when, when it's happening in a story. It's very difficult when it's happening in our story. And when we get in the tension, the, the quickest thing we want to do is figure a way out of that tension. When we make a mess in life, the only thing we want to do is figure out how to get out of the mess. And the tension is where you start dreaming of a time machine. And I'm not talking about a time machine like when you're a kid and you want to go back in time and hang out with Tupac, as cool as that would be. This is like, this is in that moment 
uh, like 12 seconds after your wife asked you how was dinner and you said to your wife, dinner was okay, not quite how my mom cooks it. Like right in that moment, you would do anything. You would cut off a pinky to be able to go back 30 seconds and never say that ever again in your life. And if you're young and married, just don't ever save that. Let me save you some trouble right now. We get in the mess. And we realize the hard truth that life only moves in one direction and time only moves in one direction. We don't get to go back and fix the things or, or take, take words back that we've spoken or undo actions. We get in the mess and many of us are in messes. We're in seasons of tension and conflict and suffering and, and this chapter seems like maybe it's been going on a long time and kind of just keeps repeating itself and you get caught in this cycle of insanity and you just so desperately want whatever you call it, a fresh start, to turn the page, turn over a new leaf. You want to move on to the next chapter. Today we're going to look in scripture and see how we can actually obtain a new chapter in our life. Before we dig in, would you guys pray with me? God, we love you. And uh, you know, we, we celebrate people who are in chapters of their life where they're celebrating and things are good. And, and God, I hope that they're giving you glory in that and they're looking to you and they're learning from you. And God, many of us are in uh, seasons of suffering and the chapters of our life are very messy. And perhaps they're messy and, and we're suffering because of something that's been done to us from outside of us. But God, oftentimes we're also suffering because of things that we have done and the decisions that we have made and the actions that we have taken and the thoughts that we have had. And, and so God, wherever we're at, I pray that you would help us to find how to move into the next chapter that you have for us and for our lives. God, give us receptive hearts and mind. I pray that your spirit would speak to the deepest parts of us. Show us how you're wanting to use even the messy seasons, how you're wanting to redeem them, how you're wanting to push us towards the people that you've created us to be. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And everyone who is ready for a new chapter, say amen. 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 Um, let's catch up real quick. We've been walking through the book of Joshua. And in the first couple of weeks of this series, we were in the first couple of chapters of Joshua. You always got to make it a few chapters in because the beginning was just the setup. We often call the Old Testament the Jewish scriptures because the majority of it tells the history of the Jewish people. And the book of Joshua starts at a unique point where this mega leader, Moses, has just died. Joshua is put into leadership over the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, and they're right at the entrance to the land that God had promised them centuries before. And so we see the setup. Joshua is positioned in leadership. He's encouraged and empowered to be strong and courageous. He sends spies out to, to see the land and see what's going on. Uh, they have a, a big obstacle, the Jordan River, that they're trying to figure out how to get an entire nation across. And God miraculously dries up the river and they walk across to the other side. They're finally in the land. That's all the setup. But now here comes the tension. Because in the land, there are nations who are living in a land that God has given Israel, but in order to completely take the land, they're going to have to take it by force. These are evil, pagan nations, lawless, no moral center. They rape their women. They sacrifice their children as burnt offerings to false gods. And God says they all have to go. And so now there's conflict. First, it's Jericho, a city that cannot be defeated because of its large fortified walls. And yet God brings the walls down and Israel has victory. Tension, victory, resolve. Next is the great nation of Ai, great and wealthy. And they come against it. And once again, they defeat it, set up, tension, resolve. In chapter 9, this is where we were at last week. Uh, things get very messy. And instead of conflict coming from outside of Israel, conflict now arises from within. Chapter 9 is very messy. Uh, a, a nation called Gibeon, who's just down the road, they're so afraid of Israel that they come and, and they humiliate themselves and they grovel at their feet and, and they deceive them. They make them believe that they're from outside the promised land and they're going to do whatever it takes to get a treaty with Israel so that they can spare their lives. And it's so sad. It says Joshua did not seek the Lord. Because of this, he entered into a treaty with an evil pagan nation who lived inside the promised land. He would never be able to fully fulfill God's command upon entering the land. It was a, a disaster. It was a very dark moment. And today we're going to see the result of the Gibeon deception. We're going to see the real mess that chapter 9 actually made in the life of Joshua and the Israelites. And yet, we're going to be reading from chapter 10. There is hope for a new chapter in your life. In Joshua 10, verse 1, it says, Now King Adonai Zedek 
This in Hebrew means king of justice. If any of you are looking for baby names, Adonai is a deck. It's a recommendation. <laughs> the king of Jerusalem heard that Joshua had captured Ai and completely destroyed it, treating Ai and its king as he had Jericho and its king, and that the inhabitants of Gibeon, these cowards, they'd made peace with Israel and were living among them. In verse 2, we learn some things we didn't know about Gibeon. So Adonai Zanek and his people were greatly alarmed because Gibeon was a large city. It was like one of the royal cities. It was even larger than I, and all of its men were known as warriors. We don't get this from chapter 9. In chapter 9, Gibeon is pitiful. I mean, man, they're deceptive. They come in with their tail tucked between their legs. They, they just butter, butter Joshua and all of Israel up. They suck up to them, and they just beg them. They're willing to do whatever. They're even willing to become Israel's servants just to spare their lives. And this tells us something. This tells us how the message of Israel's power and might has already spread throughout the land. That Gibeon, a strong fortified city with a military full of men who were known as warriors who would stand toe to toe with any other nation on any other day will not dare to stand before Israel. And we know that it's not because of the inherent power and skill and knowledge and expertise that is inside of Israel, but it's because of their God who is working through them. And we have to remember this because God is expanding our territory. We're no longer one venue, we are two. We have started to take ground. And, and it's very easy to start thinking that we're pretty good at this and we got a good strategy and we got some things figured out and Celeste can hit these high notes and that's pretty impressive and, and, and we can, we can start feeling really good about ourselves, but the moment that we forget that it is not us, but God working through us, God fighting our battles and claiming victory for us, is the day we fall. So God has gone before them, and now the news is making the rounds. And in verse 3, the king, Adonai Zedek of Jerusalem, he sent word to four other kings, King Hoam of Hebron, King Piram of Jarmuth, King Japhia of Lachish, and King Debir of Eglon. And he said to them, come up and help me. This is very strange. These nations did not work together. They didn't get together for a potluck and watch the game on Sundays. This is not how they operated. These are nations who are fighting over the same territory. They are trying to either conquer or be conquered. And Israel is such a mighty force that for this and this alone, they are willing to put aside their differences and come together. We must get rid of Israel. Come and help me. We will attack Gibeon because they've made peace with Joshua and the Israelites. You see, Joshua has been fighting one on one. Israel versus Jericho, Israel versus I. And now the game has changed. It will now be one on five. There's two reasons for this. The first one we've already seen. The power of Israel, and people think it's Israel. They're soon to learn that it's not just Israel, it's God through Israel. That power has made itself known in the land of Canaan, in the promised land. And I don't have time to preach on this. Maybe I'll come back to it someday. But this is a principle that Power attracts opposition. Power attracts opposition. When you begin to release the power of God inside of you, you will attract opposition in your life. Uh, we have been exercising our God-given power as MetaChurch to take ground in the spiritual battle that we are in, and the enemy has stopped at nothing to try and get in our way, derail us, and deceive us. We have to be aware that power attracts opposition. You guys know I did a whole series based on uh, the Marvel superhero movies. I love them. I got a little bit of nerd in me, just enough to really appreciate this. And here's what the Avengers found, right? These fictional people that I go and watch and spend $15 on a movie ticket. This is what the Avengers found. They found that the stronger they got, the more powerful enemies came after. Power attracts opposition. Another way to say this in your own life is that success breeds haters. Success breeds haters. And so listen, if you want to get on social media and you want to whine about your life and you want to let everyone know how depressed you are and how bad your boss sucks and how, how you know, misbehaved your kids are and woe is me, I promise you will have no pushback. You will have millions of people who are ready to embrace you and wallow in your misery with you. But the moment 
that you decide through the power of God to rise above your suffering, to rise above your circumstance, and live a powerful life anyway is the moment you will realize they are not embracing you to love you. They are embracing you so that you will never rise above, because as soon as you rise above, you set a contrast between what their life could be and what they've chosen their life to be, because success breeds haters. Now you can also breed haters because you're a jerk. So take an inventory of your life. You might just be a person that's hard to get along with. But power attracts opposition. Success invites haters, and that's the first reason that they're no longer playing one-on-one. -on -one. They're now going to have to go one-on-five. The second reason is very painful. It is Gibeon itself. Not just the people of Gibeon, which was a big deal, a big, strong nation full of warriors who could have joined the fight to help eradicate Israel, have now made themselves servants to Israel. They're off the table. They're no longer an option for going against Israel, and that's very frustrating to the other nations. Not only that, but Gibeon is a geographical advantage in this battle. You see, we don't get this because we're not living where this was written, but the people who originally read this, they understood that Israel camped at a place called Gilgal, and Gibeon was one day's march away, uphill the entire way. Gibeon was the high ground. We talked about this during the Battle of Jericho. The ultimate advantage in primitive, primitive warfare is having the high ground. And so the king of Jerusalem gathers four other nations, and this is their strategy. They will surprise attack Gibeon, and when they show this force and defeat Gibeon, they will now have the high ground in order to have the advantage one on five with the high ground to defeat Israel. This is their plan. And this is where we have to be really careful. This is where I have to be really careful to not project my own experiences and my own misunderstandings onto the text of scripture. Because I grew up in religion deep religion. I grew up surrounded by it and influenced by it. And when I read these two chapters together, Gibeon can start seeming a lot like punishment. Joshua really screwed up and made a huge mess in chapter 9. He didn't seek the Lord, so now they're in this alliance with Gibeon, and because they're with Gibeon, everyone's upset, and so now they're going to conquer Gibeon and take the high ground in order to defeat them, and Israel's got to fight one on five kind of feels like maybe God's punishing Joshua. Now you got to fight five. Now you got to fight uphill. If you would have just listened, we could have avoided all of this. I hope you will finally learn your lesson. Growing up in religion, uh, every time that I sinned, I kept waiting, looking around every corner for God to somehow strike me down. And uh, this is kind of funny, but it's also really sad. Because I can remember being uh, elementary age, and I lied to my parents, and I got away with it, which was really surprising to me more than anyone, because I was a terrible liar. But somehow I got away with it, and I had a few moments of being like, I don't really know how that happened, but that was pretty sweet. I was going to get in trouble, told a little lie, no big deal, no harm, no foul, here we go, parents bought it. That night, we stayed with my grandparents, and my parents got to go on a date, they didn't get to do that very often. And I remember laying in bed, convinced that my parents would have a wreck, that they would die. That would be my punishment for lying. I can remember being in middle school, having lustful thoughts. Spoiler alert, middle school boys have a lot of lustful thoughts. And I would lay in bed at night convinced that God was going to send me to hell. Sleepless nights. And, and I, had, I had heard the truth. I had heard preachers say, if you believed in Jesus, you're covered by his blood. Now and forever, your eternity is secure. It didn't matter. I'd gone against God. I was surrounded by religion. I figured punishment had to be coming. Seems like punishment. Joshua did not seek the Lord. Now he's got five nations who are going to take the high ground and come and get them. And a lot of us grew up this way. A lot of us feel like, of course my marriage is struggling. When, when I met my spouse, I was still married. It's just God's punishment. Of course my kids are rebellious. I was rebellious. You know, I, I was experimenting with drugs and sex and alcohol. Of course, this is just what I get. I mean, my mom already told me this was coming, that I'm going to have hard kids because I was such a hard kid. Now here it is. God's punishing me. Of course, I'm not being promoted. I mean, how many, how many corners I've cut, you know? Of course, I'm not blessed financially. I, I never give to the church. You know, I cheated on my taxes. Like, it's just God punishing me. We make a mess, and we do this all the time. We're just, we're broken people. 
And our human reaction when we mess up is to try and fix it. The problem is we try and fix our mess using the exact same strategy that got us in the mess in the first place. It's like we started a fire and we're going to fight it with more fire and pretty soon we have an inferno going in our life and we're stuck in the same jacked up chapter continuing to cycle through the same mess. And so we don't seek God. We don't line up our decision or our action with him. And so now we've read enough in scripture and we've come and sat in these seats enough to know that God's probably not happy with us. And so let's go fix it. Let's, let's drop a few dollars in the offering box and, and let's, let's be a little bit better husband and a, and a little bit better dad and, and I'll watch a little bit less porn and I'll try to fix it and then I'll come back and I won't bother going to God with it because he's mad at me and probably doesn't want to hear from me anyway. We do this in our relationships. Husbands, you, you screw something up and, uh, and we do all the time. And, uh, and if you're young and married, just wait, it's coming. Um, and we want to fix it, right? If I can go fix it, then I can come back as the hero and everything will be okay. And how many times have we done that? We've tried to fix it with the same strategy that we used to screw it up in the first place. And we come back, we can't figure it out because she's more mad than we were before we tried. And the reason is you need a new strategy. She doesn't want you to go fix it by yourself and come back as the hero. She wants you to let her in on it so you can fix it together and be heroes together. It takes a new strategy. And so Joshua has a, a real big decision to make. He's in the tension. Is he going to see this as punishment or is he going to see it as potential? And we, we see the answer. Everything hinges on verse 8 because the Lord said to Joshua. And if we see time and again, Joshua interacting, going to God, seeking him. When he seeks him, he finds him. Scripture says, if you seek me, you will find me. And Joshua found the Lord, and the Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them, for I have handed them over to you. Not one of them will be able to stand against you. In verse 9, he did not seek the Lord, and he made a mess, and they're stuck, and they're going to have giving in their life forever. But in chapter 10, he made a change. He went back to God, and I'm sure he was worried. Because he knew he disobeyed, and he knew that he had messed up. And when he got to God, he found a heavenly father with his arms open, waiting for him to come home, knowing that he messed up, but not having given up. And this is an amazing message for us, because a lot of us have a lot of times in our past, and we look back on a lot of chapters that we're not very proud of, and maybe you're afraid to go to God, but if you go to him, you will find that his grace is sufficient for whatever you have done in your past. You will see that his love is bigger than your mistakes. You will see that he does not see you as your greatest mistake. He still has purpose for you. He still lets Joshua lead into the battle. And the best news is, God, even while you are cycling through your mess, is still fighting your battles. And whenever you are ready to humble yourself and come back to him, he will put you back in the battle. He will let you have purpose. He will let you have significance. He will let you back in. That's how good our God is. Joshua's pumped. Verse 9, he goes, he catches them by surprise. He marches his army all night from Gilgal uphill all night to Gibeon. This feels like a really bad strategy to march uphill all night right before you start a battle the next day, but he doesn't care. God's promised the victory. He is not walking for victory. He is marching from a place of victory and he is going after him. And so here it is, the five nations, the five kings, the five armies, they think that they're surprising Gibeon and yet they are the ones that God ultimately surprises. This battle is crazy. Verse 10, the Lord threw the five nations into confusion before Israel. He defeated them in a great slaughter at Gibeon, chased them through the ascent of Beth Haran and struck them down as far as Azekah and Makeda. And as they fled before Israel, the Lord threw large hailstones on them from the sky along the descent all the way. And they died. And most of them died. More of them died from the hail than from the Israelites in the battle. Now, I, I want to try to put us in the battle for a second. I, I, I want to try to really get to this moment. This was about 6,000 years ago. A thousand years ago, we thought the world was flat and that everything in the solar system went around us. That was a thousand years ago. 6,000 years ago, they had no science, no logic, no reason. This is primitive thinking. And what could be more confusing than rocks from the sky? I hate hail. Can I just let you know that I have 
bought two new roofs in the last three years. Very frustrating, very expensive. As a matter of fact, it was so frustrating that after I was in a hailstorm, I moved. I replaced my roof and moved. And once I got into a new house, six months later, I was in a hailstorm and had to buy a new freaking roof. It was like the hail was following me. <laughs> and it's crazy, but this is what happened in Joshua 10. It was selective hail, and God is proving his dominance. These pagan nations that Israel's fighting against, they worship nature. They worship the sun and the moon and the stars. And how do you understand hail? They don't know meteorology. They know stones are on the ground and they're not in the sky, but from time to time, stones come from the ground, from the sky down onto the ground. The only thing they could think is that their little gods were up there throwing it down. But if it's their gods throwing it down, how come it's only them that it's hitting? And so they're being slaughtered by hail. And I wish that was the craziest part, but it gets crazier. This has to be one of my favorite stories of the whole Old Testament. In, in, in verse 12, what was happening is um, the sun was going down and they were winning the battle. And Joshua wanted complete victory because that was promised to him by God. And if the sun went down and it was dark, the battle was over. Their only light that they could depend on was the sun. And so Joshua makes the craziest request that you can imagine. On the day that the Lord gave the Amorites over to the Israelites, Joshua spoke to the Lord and he spoke to him in the presence of all of Israel. And he makes this insane request. And I got to be honest with you. This is how I know I still got to grow spiritually because if I was about to ask for something as stupid as Joshua was about to ask for something, I would not do it in front of you. I would go into a corner. I would whisper, pray it. God, if you could just maybe just to make sure y'all don't hear, because that's a lot of pressure. If you hear me ask my request and Joshua does it in front of all of Israel, he says, son, Stand still. I want to unpack just how crazy this is. Number one, uh, Joshua is probably in his 60s. He, he's at least 50 years old because he wandered for the full 40 years he was there before it. 50 plus years, Joshua has woken up and every single day of his life has gone the same way. The sun rises and the sun sets. You're awake, you go to sleep. You wake up and guess what? It happens all over again. It rises and it sets, and it never stops moving. And after seeing the same pattern for decade upon decade, Joshua feels like maybe today God could make an exception. Would you please have the sun stand still? I need a little more light to gain complete victory. Now, it's kind of a silly question inherently because the sun always stands still. The sun doesn't move. But this was 6,000 years ago. And everyone, even 1,000 years ago, thought that our Earth was in the center of the solar system and everything, including the sun, went around us. It didn't make sense for us to be moving because if the Earth is moving, how come we're so comfortable standing still and we don't feel that we are hurtling through space? They didn't have the reasoning to understand all of this yet. And so he asked the sun to stand still. And really what he's asking is for the Earth to stand still. Even when astronomers could see definitively that the sun was at the center of the solar system and that the earth was hurtling through space, many people didn't believe it because they didn't know how to justify the fact that we would be moving through space and not be able to feel it. And really it wasn't until Einstein and his general theory of relativity that we could understand and comprehend how something moving at a constant speed could give the illusion that you weren't moving. This is why when you're going 85 miles an hour at a constant speed through I-10, you can have a cup of coffee on your dash and it's not sloshing around, it's sitting still because the contents of the car are moving as fast as the car. But what happens when you hit the brakes? All of a sudden, the car stops moving that fast, but the contents inside continue to move 85 miles an hour until they are stopped. This is why crashes are so deadly, because you go from 70 to zero, but the contents in the car are still going 70 miles an hour. Did you know that the world at the equator is spinning on its axis at approximately 1,038 miles per hour? To slow that down even by half, to tap on the brakes would be such an incredible disruption of the gravity field that is keeping us all glued to our seats, glued to this carpet right now, that we would all, everything on earth, buildings, humans, trees, squirrels, every single thing would be flung instantly through our atmosphere and into outer space. Every single person would die. Nothing would be left on earth. The entire solar system would be disrupted. This is a big prayer. This is a crazy request. Sun, stand 
So Joshua could not have known everything we just talked about. He just knows that he's been promised victory and he needs a little more light. In verse 13, the sun stood still. You know, I can't even think of how many hours preparing for the sermon I read through different uh, philosophers and theologians, all these really smart people who have come up with literally dozens of explanations for this. Some of them have dug into the Hebrew that Joshua was originally written in and made some words in there mean things that they've never meant since or, or, or before. Uh, you know, it's like maybe it was an eclipse, maybe it was summer solstice. I mean, everyone has just all of these theories because we can't comprehend. We've, we've got to try to minimize the miracle until it fits in a place where it doesn't require faith to believe in. I don't know. I mean, I, honestly, I, I don't. All that cool science stuff that I, I just told you, I, I read that to prepare for this. I don't just know this stuff. Like, I'm not, I'm not smart enough to, to, to tell you how this would have happened without ruining the whole world. But I do know that one time we lived on the East Coast and uh, we were driving to Texas to see family. And I was sitting in the back and I was probably like middle school and I'm jamming away on like my old school Game Boy, just, you know, crushing it in Tetris. And my, my sister, who was in high school, she's in the passenger seat and her and my mom are going at it. And my sister is in all all of her, you know, preteen just glory, just really getting it, very emotional. And, and uh, it wasn't going well. And the next thing I knew is I heard, I don't know what y'all call, call them, the drunk bumps when you get a little too close to the shoulder, you know, go, 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 go. And, uh, and, and all of a sudden we're on the shoulder and, and my mom slams on the brakes. And it's the, to this day, the hardest anyone's ever slammed on their brakes with me in the car. Everything just, Aah! and then there was silence for about three seconds, and my mom looked at my sister on a major five-lane highway and said, get out. <laughs> I don't even know what state we were in. We were somewhere between Washington, D.C. and Texas. And so we were like, all right, it's happened. Mom lost her mind. Here we go. I don't, I don't know what happens next, but and she doubled down. Get out of the car. Now my sister um, is to this, she's, she's like my best friend now, she's, she's still very bold, you know, and she's gonna call mom's bluff. So she got out on the shoulder of a major highway, slammed the door, and we freaking took off. <laughs> we left, peeled out. <laughs> I will keep it all the way 100 with y'all. I started crying. I was like, <laughs> I didn't even like her back then, I was crying. I know some of y'all are getting ready to call Child Protective Services, probably on my <laughs> mom, because she did that, and we, we probably ate too much gluten back then, or something. I don't know. But uh, it was fine. We went probably three or 400 yards and then got back on the shoulder and, uh, and, and waited for my sister to walk back to the car. And uh, it was crazy, and, and, and feeling that, that pull, all of it was crazy. Um, but you know why my mom could pull on the shoulder and slam on the brakes and kick someone out of her car? Because it's her car. I don't know how the world slows down that much where you get a whole another extra day of light, but I do know that I believe, and, and it's not blind faith, it's deeply researched faith. I, I believe in creative intent and creation. I believe that everything we have here was spoken into existence by the actual words of God, and if he created it, it's his, and he can do with it whatever he wants. So the sun stood still and Joshua got victory. He got to move into a new chapter. And I know many of us want a new chapter today. And maybe you're in the middle of tension, conflict, suffering. You're in the middle of the mess and maybe the mess came to you or maybe you made it yourself. And maybe you're looking at all the things that are happening around you and a lot of them can start to feel a lot like punishment. And so what is it? Is it punishment or is it potential? Is it trying to drive you away from God or is it trying to draw you to God? And God never changes. We have to understand that. And so a lot of the outcome of our seasons of suffering and these chapters where we're stuck in the cycle of the mess, a lot of it depends on how you choose to look at it. 
Because if you take a posture of fear and, and you refuse to go to God and you try to fix it on your own and you keep on the same strategy that puts you into that situation in the first place, it will be a self-fulfilling prophecy. You will end up feeling the full weight of what you thought was a punishment that becomes a punishment, not because God made it so, but because your choices made it so. Or you can look in faith. You can believe that even if it's your mess that you made. The, the, chapter 9 that was Joshua's fault. It was his mess. And yet he had faith to go back to his father. He had faith to go back and seek God. And when you seek him, you'll find him. And when you find him, you'll find love. And you'll understand that he sees all that you've ever done in your darkest thoughts and just the, the worst parts of who you are and loves you anyway and has purpose for you anyway. And maybe it's not punishment that there's so much tension in your marriage. Maybe it's not because it started out of a sinful place. Maybe it isn't punishment as much as it is potential for you guys to have something to work on together, to push each other, to seek God together, to build a strength in your marriage that can only come through conflict where it can withstand anything and be an example and do damage as a part of the movement of Jesus. And maybe your kids aren't rebellious because you were a bad kid back in the day. Maybe they're rebellious because what they really need is for you to understand the love that God gave you even when you were far from him. So you can show that same love forward to your children and change their life and let them know that you're going to love them no matter what and be there for them no matter what. And life is hard if you run from God, but as soon as they want to come back, you're there for them. And maybe you don't have that promotion because that job isn't really the job that you'll actually thrive in. And God has something bigger for you. And in the meantime, in the disappointment, he's teaching you how to handle some things that you can never get from the promotion. And so when the job comes along, you'll actually be prepared for it. Maybe in the middle of your mess, God is preparing you for your purpose. Here's what I think it all really boils down to, and it reads really easy, but it can be very difficult to apply. A new chapter requires new choices. You cannot keep putting in the same strategies, the same decisions, the same actions, and expecting different outcomes. That's actually the definition of insanity. And some of you are in a chapter of your life right now that feels insane. It feels like you're just cycling through and repeating the same things over and over and over again. If you really want to make change, if you want a new chapter, you need new choices. What got you to this point is not going to get you out. You need something new. You need to seek God. If you believe that God is mad at you, that he's punishing you, that he could never or would never because you've done or you've thought, try him. Go to him. See if you don't experience the most pure, overflowing, abundant love that you've ever experienced in your life. Line your life up with his word. It will show you the choices to make. You can have a new chapter, but it starts with new choices. And here's how good God is. Joshua could have thought that it was five on one to punish him, but instead he saw it as potential. And in one day, he had victory over five times as many kings as he had ever had on another day. It wasn't a setup for failure. It was a setup for the significant purpose that God had for Joshua and for his chosen people, Israel. Would you pray for me? God, I just believe so strongly that, uh, that you have purpose in the life of every person here. And I also know that many of us are living very difficult chapters. And I can think of so many times in my life where I've been stuck in these chapters, unable to get out. And, and I keep trying the same things I've always tried. And so, God, I pray if we're there and we're stuck and we're in our mess, we would look to you, seek you, see what you have for us, make the changes, make new choices. And God, we believe that no matter where we've been and what we've done and, and, and how bad we've hurt people and how much chaos and confusion and destruction our choices have caused, that your love is greater, that the blood of Jesus is stronger and that you have a new chapter for us. Help us to come to you in faith. We love you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us today at MetaChurch Online. We would love to know how God is using this ministry to affect your life. If you have a story about how God has spoken to you through this online platform, we would love to hear about it. You can send an email to info at metachurch.tv. 
We would also love for you to partner with us financially to help us continue to expand what God is doing through Meta Church. You can do that very easily at metachurch.tv by clicking on the Give button. You can give a one-time donation or you can set up to give recurringly and to continually support what God is doing. Every time you give, you invest in eternity. We hope to see you here next week. Thank you.